David first contacted me November 20th, 2017. That was his first email to me asking for help with 8086 Assembler. Uh, he and I had conversed a little bit over the years. I was a fan of his channel and helped him out with a couple of technical uh, pieces of information. Uh, I'm a patron of his on Patreon. And he knew me because uh, I, had, I was a co-creator of the 88 miles per hour demo, which won uh, the revision old school demo compo in 2015. So he was aware of my assembler knowledge and he contacted me to ask uh, what was a good way to get started with 8086 assembler. And I originally uh, went back and forth with him a little bit about various tools he could use. And then one of the things I mentioned was A86, which is this very simple uh, but capable assembler of taking uh, a source file and uh, assembling it directly to a com file. So you just immediately get to assemble and run. And it ran on the original hardware. So I thought he would use A86 to make a couple of test programs and get up to speed and learn about the memory segmentation and things like that. Things that were different from the 6502. Imagine my surprise when in about February of 2018, he emailed me stating that he had already coded up a basic tile editor with CGA support and he was asking me some more advanced stuff like now how do I save stuff to a file and things like that and I was kind of like time out man pump the brakes <laughs> because I had recommended A86 to him as like a learning assembler like a teaching assembler. Uh, A86 only supports com files it has no a uh, decent debugger. It has a debugger, but it's not that great. It has no profiler, uh, no library management, no EXE support, which means no multi-segmented uh, memory binaries. And I, you know, I don't, I was like, I just, A86 was to get you started, but he was already off and running like a shot. And uh, for those of us who know and love David know that when he gets an idea in his head, he is off and running, and there's not very much that you can do to stop him. Um, but that's a good thing, because that tenacity drove Planet X3 all the way through from conception to final product. And in an era where I was reading the other day that in 2018, uh, roughly one out of every 10 Kickstarter projects actually gets funded and pushed all and fulfilled and, and completed. In an era like that, uh, David's stubbornness, for lack of a better term, uh, was exactly what Planet X3 needed and became a, to become a successful Kickstarter product. When David communicated his plan for Planet X3, uh, that it was going to be a port of Planet X2, I knew that it would be possible to convert it to the PC probably without very much trouble at all because uh, Planet X2, which I was familiar with uh, from an early point because I was one of the beta testers, um, used pretty much character cell graphics. Like it wasn't smooth scrolling by the pixel. It was essentially just, you know, the entire play field would move uh, by tile graphic uh, boundaries. And all of his tiles were 16 by 16 pixels. And that is a fantastic, any power of two measurement is fantastic for working with uh, CGA graphics. Uh, CGA graphics allow uh, eight or four or two pixels per byte. So as long as your source is a power of two, it translates to CGA very well. What David mostly needed help with from me was access with a lot of the low level stuff. Uh, he had figured out CGA graphics memory all on, its own, on his own, but uh, when it came to things like uh, how hardware interrupts worked and modifying the speed of the system timer and uh, some of the more complex uh, topics like uh, compression. Um, I'm a compression nerd. I had long ago figured out what kinds of compression was uh, appropriate and fast enough for a slow machine like this. For some of the heavier lifting, <clears throat> he sent me the source code and asked for my involvement uh, around November of 2018. And I had the source code for about six or seven weeks while I was adding all of these things. Um, integrating the sound routines from Shiru was another thing that I did. Uh, and just generally fixing bugs. I added an error handler uh, so that if there was a problem loading from disk or something like that, we would, it would exit out with a, with a nice error instead of actually just you know, crashing or locking up. And I delivered him back the final beta on, on Christmas Eve 
2018. So again, about maybe seven weeks later. And that was pretty much the development timeline uh, from my end. Now, we did run into a bug that I got very worried about when it hit larger testing. Uh, some people had tested on the Commodore PC-20-3. I think that's the exact name of the clone. It's a clone that integrates a lot of functions into a single VLSI. And it has a couple of enhancements to the original PC. For example, it has uh, a battery-backed clock, like a real-time clock function. When we ran Planet X3 on that system, David noted uh, that it ran way too fast, the music was too fast, and in fact it was so sped up that the game pretty much couldn't start. And I thought that was really weird and it worried me because I was afraid that I had coded a bug that was going to somehow surface on all of these systems after we shipped. It turns out that the method of bus settle waiting that I was accustomed to doing, which was writing out a random value to an unused port. It turns out that method failed on the Commodore because the port I had chosen, EE hex, if you're curious, uh, which IBM uses in their own BIOSes, so I'm not crazy for picking that port. It turns out that that port just happens to be where the Commodore PC-20 holds its real-time clock control information. So I was sending it a random value, and it was speeding up the system like nuts. And uh, so that explained it. And thankfully, it was so this problem is only limited to the Commodore. But I fixed it on uh, February 7th, and uh, that patch, I believe, went into the shipping version of the game. Um, for the curious, I fixed it by, instead of writing a random value uh, to an unused port, I read in from the speaker port 61H to AL, to register AL. And I could do that at that particular point in the code and trash AL because AL wasn't being used for anything in that block of code. So, lesson learned. One of my major tasks with Planet X3 was optimizing David's code. Now before you think that sounds like some sort of a slam or something, it's not. David already knew Assembler from the 6502 but he wasn't familiar with the 8086's specific architectural advantages. So a lot of my uh, optimization work was just simply correcting some of his code to better fit the 8086 architecture. For example, uh, on the 6502, uh, you are accustomed to keeping all of your fast access variables in zero page. 8086 doesn't have a zero page area. It does, however, have a lot of 16-bit registers lying around that you can use. Well, a lot is relative. There's a grand total of four. But that's still more than the 6502 had. So a lot of David's uh, sprite and tile routines could be sped up just a little bit by translating memory variables into register variables and just using them as temporary scratch space. Another optimization common one that I did is that uh, he didn't know at all about the string instructions. The string instructions in the 8086 are really fantastic. They, it, with a single opcode byte, with a single instruction, you can read from a memory location, write it to another memory location, and automatically increment both the source and the destination index registers. Very powerful instructions. You can even load CX with a counter and then tell those string instructions to go repeatedly, until, you know, decrementing CX each time until CX is empty. It's a great way to move memory around. The, C the 6502 simply doesn't have anything like that, so of course David didn't know about it. So that was a major thing that I did, translating to make things faster. Some of the challenges of using A86 as an assembler was that it was somewhat limited. Um, that's not a slam on A86, it's just that that's how it was designed, that's what it was designed to do. Take a source file and immediately in one pass spit it out as a com file. It's an incredibly fast assembler to use, but because it doesn't try to resolve that many forward references with multiple passes, we ran into a limitation where we were uh, defining all of our variables um, in the data segment as uninitialized and then as it goes th as the assembler goes through the code it has to keep track of all of those references and we had something like I mean uh, hundreds of variables and memory locations and things and every time it goes through uh, a86 went through it would try to keep track of all of these forward references forward 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 and then eventually it would run out of symbol table information 
So we got around this by, instead of defining them as uh, references that it had to keep track of, instead we defined them as hard-coded, initialized areas in the code segment. And at the start of the program, <laughs> there's a jump all the way past all of those initialized da <laughs> data variables to the start of the main program. And it's ugly, but com files have everything they're used to keeping both data and code in the same segment. So it doesn't really matter. It's not like we were breaking any rules or anything. And this allowed A86 to not have to keep track of so many references. One of the problems writing a program for DOS, for the PC, that uses interrupts and messes with the system timer is that if you have a bug in your interrupt handler or in what the interrupt handler is calling, it can be incredibly hard to find the bug and fix it. We had a bug where it manifested only on the real hardware, not in an emulator. In an emulator, you've got this great debugger that you can use and you can set breakpoints and all sorts of great stuff and you can trace through the interrupt as it happens. You can even fire, up, fire off an interrupt out of order. On the real hardware, you have none of that visibility. Now, if the original PC was a 386, we would have had that visibility because the 386 has a protected mode, it has a virtual 8086 mode, and you can run debuggers like Softice to uh, run the program in a protected area and you can you can break into it and, and get your debugging done but on the real machine you can't so how did I find and debug this issue well I added essentially poor man's printf debugging to the executable uh, I displayed at all times a series of blinking dots in the upper left hand corner one dot was for whether or not interrupts were enabled or at all. Another was, uh, would blink at the rate of um, calling David's game housekeeping routine. And then a third dot would blink for whether or not it was calling the uh, Shiru's music routines. And through that, I was able to figure out what the bug was uh, and fix it. Another source of time spent debugging was in the music routines that outputted to the OPL2 LPT uh, FM hardware dongle that I believe David sells on his website and is also available from Vertishop. This is a nice little homebrew project. It's, a, it's essentially an ad lib on a parallel port dongle and you plug it in and then you can send, uh, you can reroute FM commands instead of to an ad lib if you don't have one of those to the parallel port dongle. It's wonderful, and David wanted to add support in Planet X3. So Shiru added support for it, and uh, I received uh, both an OPL2 LPT and an OPL3 LPT directly from Vertishop. And so I tested it on lots of hardware. I tested it on the original PC, I tested it on a, a PS2 Model 30, um, on a 46, and on all of them, the output was mangled and Shiro and I spent several days looking through the music code researching timing of sending data to FM ad lib you know registers all this stuff and it worked correctly like on one of my machines but it was just garbled output on the rest of them and I was at my wits end until somebody clued me into to a post I think it was on the Vogons forum where Someone realized that some parallel port implementations based on the kind of uh, output voltage that they have, or maybe their timing or some, something having to do with the parallel port, necessitated adding a pull-up resistor to the OPL2 LPT hardware. And I saw that, and I soldered a little pull-up resistor to the pin in question, and suddenly everything worked. So there was never anything wrong with the software, ever. Sorry, Shiru. Um, it was the hardware only ever having been tested on whatever the homebrew designer could get his hands on, probably, you know, Pentium laptops and things like that. Turns out a lot of the older parallel ports needed this pull-up resistor. So, crisis averted. As frustrating as it is to have a bug that doesn't happen in an emulator, but does happen on the real hardware, it's just as frustrating to find a bug that only surfaces in the emulator and not on the real hardware. 
And we were using, at least I was using, a custom build of DOSBox that I like to use called DOSBox X. It's a great uh, version of DOSBox. It has a wonderful debugger built in and it's it kept up to date by John Campbell. However, he had added something to it a long time ago that enhanced compatibility when you were emulating faster systems, but it actually ended up causing a problem if you had the cycle count way low trying to emulate a slower system. And of course I was doing all my testing both on the real hardware and also in a slower version of the emulator so that I could you know, see how things were progressing. And for days I ran into this thing where Planet X3 would just lock up and eventually Working with John Campbell, we found it was a bug in the emulator. So you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't. I'm really happy with the way Planet X3 turned out. The goal from the beginning was to limit the design and programming choices to systems around the mid to late 1980s era. And I feel like we absolutely succeeded. The game doesn't merely run on old PCs. It runs great on old PCs. And you really get the feeling uh, playing it, especially like on a Tandy 1000, that it is definitely a game that could have come out during that era. Um, I used to work at uh, Babbage's and Egghead Software when I was a teenager in the 1980s. And so I've seen a whole bunch of software games go through that whole thing. And of course I also collect and restore them today. And I tell you all this because I want to tell you when I got the final package, the final box art, the label, the manual, I can tell you from first-hand experience it absolutely could have passed for a real quality retail game of the 1980s. And to me, I think that is just as great an achievement as actually getting the game working as well. So I'm very happy to have been involved with the development of Planet X3. Uh, I had a great time doing it, and uh, now that I have an official programmer credit on Moby Games, I can cross that item off my bucket list.